Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, climate change. The believers, the deniers, the millions displaced, the trillion dollar global economic losses. As the UN's Climate Change Committee releases its latest report, we look at the real consequences. Also this week, from Afghanistan to Iraq, one man's story of trying to repair war-torn economies. He tells us of the mistakes in one of the most costliest wars and how business could have helped. And is it the end for the humble watch? Wearable devices are apparently the next big thing. We ask one of the big Swiss watchmakers if they're worried about technology's advance. So, climate change this week, frankly, it's a topic so big and consequential we could do it every week on this show. But the catch right now is the IPCC, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and its fifth major assessment report, which is out this week. The fact is the contents of such a report do affect us all. Millions have already been directly affected. Think of the Philippines, for example. There was a lot of talk about how the warming Pacific Ocean played a part in last year's catastrophic typhoon Haiyan. Well, if that's the case, then look at the kind of damage it can bring. I actually shot these pictures uh, on my phone when we left Takloban by helicopter after shooting a Count in the Cost special there last year. The devastation, as you can see, is astonishing. This was only a month after the typhoon hit, I'll give you that, but it will take years to recover from. Storms of that magnitude spare nothing, and if climate change is contributing to their ferocity, then that's concern for all of us. Certainly the IPCC is concerned. By the end of the week, the report wasn't out, but some of its details had been leaked, predicting hundreds of millions of people to be affected by coastal flooding and displaced due to land loss. This will happen, it believes, mostly in Asia, leading to forced migration. Crop yields are expected to fall by 2% per decade at a time of rapidly growing demand for food. And if you want to start putting this into dollar terms, well, we're talking 1.4 trillion of them could be wiped off the world's current economic output of $71.8 trillion. Now, we could bring you case studies from pretty much anywhere in the world on this topic, but we've chosen Alaska. For one, it is visually spectacular, but also it's such an extreme environment there. And really, when extreme environments are affected by global warming, you know it's pretty serious. Here's our report from Daniel Lack in a unique underground laboratory outside Fairbanks, Alaska, where even the permafrost, the perennially frozen land, is beginning to thaw. How deep are we now? Above we are 60 feet below the surface. Through frozen ground, a tunnel back in time to when the earth last warmed up and the ice melted. The ceilings bristle with ancient plants and along the walls, the bones of extinct mastodon and bison. Once this part of Alaska was a fertile plain before the glaciers rolled in tens of thousands of years ago. As you can see, we've got a very big ice wedge right here on the left and over here. While other scientists come to see fossils, soil and ice formed long ago when temperatures fluctuated, Kevin Biela studies engineering issues for the United States military and how to plan for the effects of melting permafrost. If we can tease out that information that says what was the temperature prior to one of these climate horizons that we see, either vegetation or the ice emplacement, we would have really good information for the climatologists, the climate modelers that are working on that, that issue right now. Work on a much larger tunnel has begun. Research here is aimed at helping Alaskan people and communities cope with something they've already begun to notice, how melting permafrost causes homes and roads to sag, and how it's probably going to get worse. The idea is not to scare anybody. It's not to uh, set, a, you know, set out this, this notion that everything's thawing and we need to stop burning gasoline. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about trying to anticipate changes. There's real alarm among scientists. Permafrost is warming rapidly. Even worse, a huge amount of carbon is trapped in the frozen ground, those plants and animal bones, and that will be released into the atmosphere as it thaws. Warmer climate, there will be more permafrost thawing, producing more greenhouse gases, increasing uh, this greenhouse effect, which will increase temperature again. And increased temperature will uh, thaw more permafrost. When the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was opened in 1977, no one expected a changing climate. But they put the pipe on stilts to meet environmental regulations protecting the tundra and forest. 
So the way this pipeline is constructed, that prevents permafrost from melting locally. But it's what's inside the pipe, crude oil, and its consumption. The impact of that on the world's permanently frozen ground, those are the much larger issues that government, scientists, and the planet have to consider. And in doing so, they do well to have a look at this latest IPCC report, which we're going to discuss with Dr. Salim al Haq. He's a senior fellow in the Climate Change Group at the International Institute for Environment and Development. He's in Yokohama, where the IPCC event is happening. Uh, Dr. Salim, it's always a, a major moment when the IPCC comes out with one of these reports. And some of the content did get leaked early this week. Now, obviously, I'm not the expert here. You are. Uh, but it did surprise me to see quite how grim the outlook was for so many aspects of climate change, a very, very grim scenario. Well, the report hasn't been finalized yet. It will be in a couple of days' time. But yes, you're quite right. The scenario since the last report has, in fact, become a lot worse. On the other hand, we also have some improvements, particularly in our knowledge on how to adapt to these uh, inevitable and, and uh, uh, harmful impacts of climate change. But it's still going to be a long climb. Yeah, well, can, can you give any sort of time frame? How does the IPCC present this? Because it gives all these headlines, which appear very bad. But actually, how far ahead into the future are we looking here? Uh, and I guess, to that end, how long do we have to turn it around before it becomes too late? Sure. Well, there, there's two uh, major timelines that one needs to think about. There's the long timeline, which is the next five to ten decade, decades, which takes us to the end of the century, over which we are headed for well over three degrees, possibly over four degrees temperature at the current rate. And unless we bring that down to well below two degrees, which is quite possible, but it is going to take a lot of action required, particularly to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases over the next decade or two. So the long-term trajectory is bad, but it can be brought down. The more near-term trajectory, which is the next 10, 20 years, is unfortunately locked in. No amount of mitigation is going to prevent some degree of warm, warming, probably in the order of two degrees over the next few decades. And for that, we're going to have to adapt to it. We're going to have to cope with it. We're going to have to deal with it. As far as making those changes and adapting, I see uh, two parts. There has to be the will, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but there also has to be the capacity, financial capacity. These sorts of changes that need to be made, do the places that need to make them actually have the finances to deal with it again before it becomes too late? Well, the world certainly has the financial capacity to do this. It is a trivial amount in the few hundreds of billions of dollars, which is nothing compared to the kind of subsidies we've been giving to the fossil fuel industry, for example. But the poorest countries, or who are the ones who are going to be affected, certainly don't have that amount of money. It's going to have to come from the rich to help them. Uh, on the other hand, they have been doing quite a lot on their own, but there is only so much they can do by themselves. They will require a lot of assistance, financial assistance in particular, from the rich countries. Which brings me on to this idea of the will to make these changes. You know, it seems to me that the, the, the lobby groups, the climate change deniers, are still very successful even in the face of such damning evidence and grim forecasts. Can you, can you explain to our viewers why that is? Because on the face of it, you might wonder, well, how are climate change deniers so successful? Well, I'm afraid that I, I don't have a good explanation. They, you certainly are right. They have won the battle for people's minds and, and thoughts, particularly of the leaders um, who think that this is a problem that will go away if they don't do anything. I think what they've not realized is that a decision to not take action is a decision with consequences. And those consequences are now, now going to come home to roost. Uh, just very recently, for example, in the UK, they had floods, very severe floods, for a small part of the country, which is going to cost them over a billion pounds in loss and damage. So. Even rich countries are going to have to face the impacts of climate change uh, and no amount of money is going to be able to buy them out of the impacts. So how, on a personal note, how positive are you about the future that reports like this IPCC report will actually make people react accordingly? I'm optimistic in terms of people reading it and reacting to it. And I, I particularly work on adaptation in some of the poorer countries the least developed countries in particular, and I know that they are acting very much uh, on the, the impacts of climate change and doing what they can, as I said. Bangladesh, for example, the country I come from, has already put in the order of $400 million worth of adaptation activities of its own money. It, it obviously, it requires more money from the rich countries, but it isn't waiting for them to come to its rescue. It's going ahead and doing things. So I find optimism in actual activities that people are doing where I find pessimism is in the world leaders acting in the way that they need to act. That is Dr. Salim Al-Haq talking climate change with us. We thank you for your time. Thank you.
And still ahead on Counting the Cost, the new battle between classic timepieces and smart watches. Will wearable devices be the death knell for the humble wristwatch? We're moving all over the world this week and next it's Iraq and Afghanistan, two places where war has been a costly affair for everyone concerned. Now without ever forgetting the human toll, we want to show you just how costly. According to the Harvard Kennedy School, the cost of the wars could rise to six trillion dollars, taking into account medical costs as well. The US borrowed about two trillion dollars to finance the Afghanistan and Iraq wars of which $148 billion never directly benefited the U.S. at the time when its financial system was in total meltdown back in 2008. So, where did it all go wrong? Well, our next guest knows what happened on the ground better than most. He is Paul Brinkley, former United States Deputy Undersecretary for Defense under Presidents Bush and Obama, and also the author of a book called Warfront to Storefront. Paul, thank you for your time. The thing I took away from your book was that you seem to feel that America's real strength is actually in its private sector and perhaps that's what needs to be concentrated if you're going to talk about going into places that need development for whatever reason remember the private sector well i think that i think that we're learning a very interesting set of lessons here you know if we think of this past decade and the experiences the united states has had uh, in the conflict areas particularly iraq afghanistan using Iraq as an example, a trillion dollars uh, spent over a decade, 40,000 casualties, Afghanistan, $700 billion, uh, thousands of casualties. We had a mindset that if we created democratic institutions, um, good things would happen. Hold elections, structures, put in place structures, the economy will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And I personally think that's a bit backwards. Um, coincident at least, with establishing democratic institutions is the need to build an economic base that can sustain a middle class who has a stake in maintaining democratic institutions. And I honestly think that we missed that in the last decade. And the irony for the United States in that is that that's the most dynamic part of our own experience as Americans and in our engagements in the world that um, our ability to foster and create economic prosperity through collaborative engagement uh, in societies throughout the world, somehow we did not apply those lessons in these two important areas. And I think that's part of our foreign policy that needs to change if our objective is to see the establishment of institutions that reflect mm. the values that, that, we, that we purport to want to project in the world. Well, you, you pointed out in the book, and it's perhaps not such a well-known fact, that Iraq's industrial workforce was actually disbanded as well under that initial group, the Coalition Provisional Authority, the, the CPA, just as the army and other state institutions were disbanded. I mean, this is kind of crystal ball gazing here, but could it have been different if Iraqi business and industry had been given more of a chance in those early days? What do you think? Well, you know, the early occupation in Iraq, the people who were focused on economic development tried to apply what they believed were lessons learned from Eastern Europe where the countries that most aggressively disabled state ownership, state-sponsored activity, were the countries in general that prospered the fastest in Eastern Europe. And they tried to take that model and apply it in Iraq, right. where you had a much different type of economy under the former Ba'athist regime. It was socialism, but a, a strange form and very localized conditions in factories and industrial operations around the country. Mm. So when all of those industrial capabilities were taken offline through early policy decisions with the hope that a free market would quickly emerge, that didn't happen. You had open borders, a mass importation of consumer goods, food, agricultural products that basically brought Iraqi industry to its knees. And so a workforce that honestly was full of optimism for a better future in 2003, 2004, 2005, and said saw mass unemployment, creating an environment where sympathy with, uh, with, with insurgency uh, became much more widespread. And so if you think about, and I like to look back, you know, I think it's fair a decade on to have an honest appraisal of our foreign policy decisions mm -hmm. in these places. And if you look at it and say, had we approached the problem differently, had we engaged in a productive way with Iraqi industry and that extremely competent professional workforce to develop economic ties 
that would coincide with the establishment of democratic institutions, I think we could have had a very different experience in Iraq. And that's a lesson we need to learn. So tell me then, Paul, about your experience post-2006 when you became Deputy Undersecretary of Defense uh, specializing in business transformation. Yeah. And you, I mean, that's basically being tasked with getting Iraqis back to work. How on earth did you approach that? Did you come into that job and look at it and think, oh my gosh, where do we start? Well, I mean, the scale of it was remarkable and most disappointing was after three years of the international occupation in Iraq, um, you had over in many places 50 to 60 percent unemployment. And one of the things I like to talk about when I speak to audiences in the West, imagine how many police it would take to maintain security in a Western city if you had 50 to 60 percent unemployment. Mm. And yet that's what we were asking our soldiers and Marines and deployed mm. forces to do in a country where they didn't speak the language and they didn't understand the culture. Um, and so for us, it was really a lot of hard grassroots work, bringing in business leaders, engineers, accountants, geologists, mm -hmm. agronomists, to go in to farm communities, to industrial operations, determine what needed to take place to get them up and running again. Just a final thought, Paul, briefly on the situation right now. Obviously, we're at a stage where the United States' influence in Iraq has been drawn down. Uh, but violence is still very high. It is arguably even worse than where it has been in the last few years. How can business even survive in that environment? Iraq uh, has a, what I would describe as a stable but violent current set of conditions. And it, I think they have great economic underpinnings. If one looks at Western Iraq, Western Iraq economic opportunity is far less than we see in the south and in the north of the country. And until that access to opportunity is equalized, uh, through you know, productive business engagement and policies uh, that create uh, a business climate that fosters investment and development in the West, you're still going to have a disaffected young population that wants access to opportunity. Where I'm most concerned is Afghanistan. Afghanistan today simply is still far too dependent upon foreign aid. Most of its budget comes from foreign aid. Most of its uh, economic activity, over half of its nominal GDP today, is the direct result of foreign aid. And as our forces withdraw and draw down, whatever the future holds in terms of the force posture in Afghanistan, no one believes that the level of foreign aid is going to continue. And these recent horrific acts of violence in Kabul, I think, are recognition by uh, the Taliban and other actors that driving out the international community and withdrawal of economic support will create the kind of conditions that will foster uh, unrest and insurgency in that country. And that's a real concern for me. Um, and so Afghanistan, of the, of the two examples, is a cause of great concern because we failed to build an economic foundation on which democratic institutions could rest. And, and I think that's going to be a problem we face for the next several years. Paul Brinkley, a pleasure talking to you today from Dubai. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Finally this week, this thing, the wristwatch. Now, if you're to believe the hype, then the next big thing is the smartwatch, a wearable device that will control your life the way your phone possibly already does. And while it's not known what the actual market will be like, Business Insider Intelligence recently came up with a figure of $12 billion, which isn't a bad start. So what does that mean for classic watches? Does a company like Hublot, the Swiss watchmaker, see this as a threat? Well, perhaps not, given it currently makes the most expensive timepiece in the world a little $5 million number. But even so, we would like to ask the CEO of Hublot and the president of watches at the luxury group LVMH. It is Jean-Claude Bivet. He's at the Baal World in Switzerland, which is the biggest event in the watch and jewellery industry. Jean-Claude, you make, if I put it simply, real watches. Um, but technology is taking down this path of, of, of wearable technology, eye watches and the like. Are you at all interested or even concerned about where this is going? Is it something you would even consider getting involved in? You know, we are concentrated on the watchmaking art. And the watchmaking art is eternal, is like art. Uh, the technology watch comes from an industrial process and any technology will become obsolete. And uh, uh, the information watch, the eye watch, mm. will be obsolete. I don't know when, in three, five or eight years. And one day it will even be no repairable anymore. While we are concentrated 
somehow on eternity. It's like Big Ben in London. 100 years old, it still works. And that is where we are. And as we are doing this type of uh, products, as our average price is 27, 28,000 US dollar, we can not touch an iWatch mm. that retails three or four or five hundred uh, dollars and that is obsolete in five years and that in ten years you cannot repair anymore. That's not the business, that's not our concept and it's not the message of our brand. But didn't I hear a rumour, or maybe it was fact, you tell me, that people from the technology sector, Apple in particular, were trying to, to poach your employees. They were, you know, they wanted help essentially with their technology watches. Maybe they realised that they needed some proper watchmaking expertise for their information yes, creations. Yes, it was a brilliant, it is a brilliant decision. And I just hope, because I love Apple, that they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the fact, you know, Apple is a, not only a technology company, it's also an incredible retailer. Uh, and number two, it's somehow a luxury uh, brand. And if they are a luxury brand, or they want to appeal to be a luxury brand, mm. uh, they should really do the watch in Switzerland <laughs> because they will have an advantage on all their competitors uh, like uh, Samsung or Sony or whoever because they will have the Swiss made and Swiss made brings additional value but they will not compete mm. because we are not in the same field they will not compete with the high-end Swiss watches they might compete with the low-end but not with the high-end okay so let's talk more about the high-end if you're making watches which average out at about $25,000 is there actually much growth in that market? You know, we've seen so much economic downturn in the last five or six years across the global economy. What sort of growth do you then see in what is a very niche market? Well, uh, the growth is probably higher in this upper end than in the lower end. And if you look at Swiss exports and you can see the numbers, watches that retail between uh, uh, 15 to 30,000 US dollar is the category of watches that has the highest growth. If we're looking at growth areas, um, you know, if you're talking about places where there is more growth and there is more wealth, it immediately makes me think of China. However, I've read here that Chinese buyers aren't really into the, the, the Tag Heuers and the, and the Hublots of this world. Why is that? And is it something that you would then maybe tailor what you do to go after that market because there is growth and wealth there? Yes, for our brands, we started a little bit late in China and we have uh, Tag Heuer or Hublot. We are a quite sporty watch. The Chinese do not consider for the moment a uh, 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 sport as being a luxury uh, product. Uh, a sporty watch, the Chinese do not consider it for the time being as a luxury watch. So they are reluctant to buy watches that look sporty, while in Europe or South America or Russia or Middle East, exactly the, the contrary. And the Chinese are as we were 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, but they will change because the new generation comes up and comes up very quickly. And that is the reason why we do not want to change our DNA. We stick to our policy, we stick to our marketing strategy, we stick to our design because we are sure that the young generation will come to us and they will not buy as their parents. But for the time being we have to, need to be patient, but for the time being we have growth even without China. So China is just a plus which we're going to add, so China for us is a fantastic potential. Jean-Claude, I think it's admirable you stick so passionately to your craft and don't get caught up in all the fads. It's been great hearing from you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And that's it. Time's up for this week's show, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com. You can click through to the programs link and from there you'll find the Counting the Cost page with all our previous episodes for you to catch up on. You can also get in touch with us if you like. Twitter's the easiest way. Start with me, at Kamal AJE. Also our business editor, at Abid Oliver Ali. And don't forget to use the hashtag counting the cost as well. Or just drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>